Good evening. I'm Tim Bolton, Head of Programmes here at Dartington. And on behalf of everyone at Schumacher College in Dartington, I'd like to welcome you to this, our third talk in Series 2 of our online Joy of Six Schumacher College Earth Talks. And thank you all so much for supporting the work of Schumacher College. We've been holding Earth Talks for a number of years, face to face in the Old Poston and the Great Hall at Dartington. It's a fundamental part of our learning community and we look forward to doing so as soon as, again, as soon as is practical. However, Schumacher College has a very long history of leadership, debate and research around ecological and environmental stewardship. And it feels important in this moment of global crisis that we reach out to our community and those in search of a new normal. As in previous talks, the audience appears to be joining us from across the globe. I'm in the far southwest of England on the border with Cornwall and our speaker, speaker Margaret Wheatley is in Utah. We may all be in some form of lockdown, but the world feels increasingly interconnected and all of us increasingly interdependent. This talk is the third in the series of six, which take place every Wednesday evening, and which I hope you'll also want to attend. If you're new to the online Earth Talks, then all the previous talks are also available on the Schumacher College website, as is an archive of Earth Talks from the last few years. This series of talks are formed around a common overarching theme, seizing the opportunity for radical transformation. Over the last four months, we have truly stepped into uncharted territory, simultaneously tragic, terrifying and exhilarating. Through COVID-19 and more recently, the murder of George Floyd and the International Black Lives Matter movement, we have witnessed both some of the best and the worst that mankind has to offer. And the divisions in our societies have never been brought into sharp focus. Many of the world's governments have made the kind of immediate, massive and radical changes to protect the well-being of their populations, which completely invalidate their previously slow and cautious responses to our current societal, environmental neglect, exploitation and degradation. This moment feels like almost anything is possible. So how do we resist squandering this opportunity and just return to normal or worse? So first, a few words about the format of the evening. In a moment, I hand over to Margaret Wheatley to pre present her talk. We do want the session to be as accessible and interactive as possible. However, on this occasion, Meg has asked that if you can resist using the chat and Q&A buttons until the end of the talk to aid concentration on the content, there will be a question session towards the end of the evening. So please do prepare to fire your questions and observations in at that point, And I'll do my best to field as many questions as I can. In total, we anticipate the session to last just about an hour. So let me start by introducing Margaret Wheatley. Margaret Wheatley began caring about the world's peoples in 1966 as a Peace Corps volunteer in post-war career. In many different roles, speaker, teacher, consultant, advisor, formal leader, her work has deepened into an unshakable conviction that leaders must learn how to invoke people's inherent generosity, creativity, and need for community. As this world tears us apart, sane leadership on behalf of the human spirit is the only way forward. She is co-founder and president of the Bacana Institute. She has been an organizational consultant since 1973 and a global citizen since her youth and a prolific writer. She has authored 10 books from the classic Leadership and the New Science in 1992 to Who Do We Choose to Be? Facing Reality, Claiming Leadership, Restoring Sanity, and most recently, Warriors for the Human Spirit, a songline a journey guided by voice and sound, which has been available as a CD since April, but is published today as a book. So it's with huge pleasure that we welcome Margaret Wheatley back to Schumacher College and Dartington. Over to you, Meg. Well, thank you, Tim, and hello, everyone. Looking at those images of Dartington and Schumacher, I'm filled with such beautiful memories and the power of the community. Um, that gathers there. I also just saw a sign from the state of California, one of those big electronic signs, and it said, do not gather. And that's a state that's going back into lockdown. So here we are. Um, I played with the initial invitation. The title was How Can We Seize This Time of Radical Transformation? something like that. And for me, it became 
we are seized, we are taken over, we are in a situation that is truly radically transforming everything. But I wanna first note the potential, no, I think it's real arrogance in believing that it's up to us to seize this moment and make good of it. And I will talk more about that. I chose as a title, this wonderful, I also used it as a, a book title, O oh, Brave New World, O oh, Brave New World that has such people in it. At the time I chose it for its great uh, two opposing interpretations when Shakespeare wrote it in the text. It was Miranda suddenly seeing humans for the first time having lived a very sequestered life on a magical island. And she was beholding human beings for the first time and she was in rapture. She was dazzled by them. I just learned that the word dazzled, the word brave meant dazzling or to be dazzled in Shakespeare's time. But then of course, Aldous Huxley made it famous in his dystopian novel, Brave New World. Now, I, I went back and I read The Tempest again, and what I was so struck by is, I think someone could do a modern uh, staging of that using our political leaders, because it's so filled with magical thinking. Uh, playing with magic, it's filled with a subterfuge and, and uh, uh, murder, potential murder and lies and deceit and uh, infighting. It would make a very current description, but I just wanna focus on the magical thinking of it because that's, that is what is so prevalent. We can also say that magical thinking is another definition is that it's when we refuse to face reality, refuse to face what's truly going on. Now, what is going on? Well, I hear so many things we just heard in the introduction in this Earth series. This is about radical transformation. That's one concept, one description of what's going on. I've heard other people describe it as a pause, a time to reflect a time to enjoy your families, a time to garden. That all describes me, by the way. Um, and to really go inside and discover that we like simpler living. We like not having so many things. Uh, we like this pace of life. If we've been able to be inside, uh, we had problems with our children homeschooling them. But a lot of people have noticed for the first time that they like being with their families and they like this pace that allows them time for reflection. Then I've heard other people describe it, the head of a, a global foundation, I must say I was really shocked by this, he called it a correction. And then others of us have called it the possibility for moving forward the issues that we've been working on for so long. And then uh, I've written down here, so others of us have described it as an awakening opportunity for us finally to see what's important around the climate, around social justice, around the poor, around the role of women and children, all these issues that we have been so passionately and laboriously working for, for so many years. It feels like this is an opportunity for the whole world to be noticing, just has experience of throughout major developed economies, uh, we're noticing institutionalized racism, we're, in, we're noticing oppression, we're noticing uh, our healthcare systems and whether they're uh, good enough, whether they can cope enough. We've seen all the fractures and fissures in, in developing nations. We've seen these issues and we've seen what it's like to experience clean air, silence, uh, no traffic. Uh, and then we've had these, I, these images always really, I find quite depressing of city, whole city streets abandoned, no one walking on them. Then we saw them filled with protests. So of course this is 
open to multiple interpretations of what's going on. Um, Joe Biden's presidential campaign, I just learned the motto will be build back better. So obviously seeing this as an opportunity to see the issues that have been exposed in all domains, uh, all domains. I mean, our universities are at risk of failing economically, our schools are in trouble because we can't let the kids back in. And then there's the economy, which is just just in ruins actually. And then to that, we add the issues of the environment and social justice and hunger, poverty, homelessness, all these things have been exposed. So Joe Biden wants to build back better. We all want things to change for the better, but I want to talk to you, to all of us really as activists for this time, but I'm going to again say that I think it's quite arrogant for us to, and, and troubling because it, and it leads to a certain kind of depression if we put it all on us. I mean, one of the assumptions of seizing this as an opportunity for radical transformation, one of the great uh, problems with that is that when we fail, and I will talk more about why I say that, but when we fail, we'll think that we failed. And this is not the situation that's going on. So I'm addressing you as people of passion and purpose and caring and love for the earth and all its beings. What happens is that we can only see what's going on now through our lenses, our well-developed lenses of the causes we support, of the values we hold, of the morals that we hold dear. We're interpreting what's going on. If we interpret it as an opportunity, it's because for so many years, up until the pandemic, we could not get leaders' attention. We couldn't get their attention on healthcare. We couldn't get their attention on what's happening with kids and schools and education. We couldn't get their attention on the climate crisis. So now we, one interpretation I heard in Tim's introduction is leaders have suddenly shown that they can make all these decisions fast. But that's not true. They made decisions to economically hold up those who were being so um, brought down by the pandemic, loss of job, loss of income, unable to see your families, do not gather, being locked down. They scrambled at an economic level and now we know what will be the consequences of that. So the US debt doubled. Uh, I just learned that Britain, you know, uh, GDP went down 25%. And still there is a need for more investment for money that does not exist. So to interpret leaders fast response as intelligent, sane, well thought out and with a future focus, I just think is absolutely wrong. They had to do what they had to do. And so many of the decisions made in this pandemic situation are about doing what works right now with no thought for the future. We're just trying to shore up an economy and a population so that we can get through this. But as we all, I think now know, there is no return to normal and the pandemic is far from over. Remember, I'm speaking from the United States, but it's terrible what's happening in parts of Africa, in the US, in, in South and Central America. So we're not out of this at all. So we have an economy, I would say, that is in ruins. But what is our role then? So seeing what could be possible, I wanna make a distinction that it's very easy to know what needs to be done to solve a problem. I mean, I think this is the history of the environmental movement. We, ha we had such great initiatives right there in Totnes even. Um, we knew what would be successful to correct climate, 
destruction. We've known that since the 50s by some reports. Certainly in the 60s, we knew what had to be done and it hasn't been done. I've said over and over because it feels so important to say it. The solutions we needed, we had. It was the implementation, it was the lack of will, it was the lack of leadership. Do we have the leadership now to create the changes in all of the systems that have now been exposed for what they truly are? Do we have that leadership? Well, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. So I, it comes back to us, but not to be the leaders at the level of social change that is needed. Um, when I, my last two books have been very clear that we are dealing with systems that have emerged and you do not change emergent systems by working backwards. You do not deconstruct them. You do not take the parts that created them and tinker with them and change them out because you still have the system that has its own power and its own downward causation. So the only alternative is to start over. Well, we did that as well. There were so many initiatives all over the world. I'm well aware of them. I wrote a book about seven of them that were outstanding examples uh, that I was intimately connected with. But where are we now with these causes and these solutions and this current environment created by the pandemic, where are we now? I think many of us are ambushed by hope. Uh, hope is always accompanied by fear so that anything you expect is just uh, one person, I love this quote, he said, expectations, that's the kind of hope I'm speaking about, outcomes, hope for outcomes. He said, expectations are just premeditated disappointments. That's true. But we are right now thinking there's a lot of possibility of, of uh, there's a lot of hope because we know that some people really appreciated clean air, silent skies, um, working with the earth. We know that some people really appreciated getting to know their families and having intimate relationships over Zoom, which was a big surprise to all of us, I think. And they're getting deeper in many situations. At the same time, we're completely fatigued by being on screen so, so long in the day. So hope is an ambush because it obscures our vision of what's really going on. It obscures our understanding of what's truly going on. And in that way, hope is a set of rose-colored glasses, I guess. So how do we see what's really going on so that we can still contribute? Um, my overall theme here, besides probably depressing you in a way that I feel is necessary, but has purpose to it. My overall theme here is, can we see clearly so that we may act wisely? If we don't see clearly what's going on, if we don't understand all the conditions, all the forces, all the dynamics at play, and we're just finding these singular good news uh, dynamics, like people were more compassionate, people paid attention to their neighbors, people, there was more loving kindness, individually. If we just focus on that, more self-awareness in a few people, if we just focus on that, then we're not seeing clearly. And if we can't see clearly all the dynamics at play, then we cannot choose wise action. We'll do what we always did and we'll end up even more bitterly disappointed than in the past. So this is what I really want to make clear. People talk about this as an unprecedented time. That is not true. This happens in every human civilization on the planet at the end of its life cycle. What we are experiencing now is part of the pattern of how civilizations rise and fall. So I wanna look at that, but before I read you a description that always just stuns me for its accuracy. 
I also want to say that there are ways to look for objective information. But those are facts. Now, you probably still remember a world in which facts were valued, uh, but remember, I live in America. So we can look at science and we can look at history. And both of those, the similarities in having faith in that they are more objective, importantly more objective, is that when you look through the lens of science and you look through the lens of history, you see patterns. And those patterns become predictors of future behavior. In science, we call those laws. And they are predictors of what a very high level of probability of what will happen. So a pattern and a, and a scientific law are uh, replicable. And that's their great asset to us. So when I'm going to talk about a pattern of history, and it's a great opportunity is that it gives us a sense of understanding where we are now in a well-defined pattern. And so many historians over the years have written about uh, collapse, about the end of civilizations, and there are more books about that now. But I want to read to you from a description uh, when I, in my book, so who do we choose to be? There it is. I, I used the work of a British historian, Sir John Glubb, who noted what was happening in 13 civilizations over time, primarily in the Middle East and in, and in Asia. Um, and then there are other historians who have looked much more broadly, not only in Asia and Europe, South America, indigenous civilizations, the great kingdoms of the Incans and the Mayans. And there are discernible patterns. The patterns, in fact, are scary down to the precision of their details. For example, in every civilization, education, which starts out as filled with learning, developing great minds, developing the power to think, developing the arts. Over time, as the civilization gets more materialistic, which always happens, gets ruled by business, which always happens, education becomes technical job training. We could look at that in Baghdad or Byzantium, uh, and certainly now it's happening in our, in our uh, great universities and colleges in the West. Education has become the means for a good job. So you train to be well employed, so you will have a good standard of living. So that's just one specific. I will talk more about some of the details. But, but here is a description. The last stage of a civilization, in Sir John Glove's uh, terms, there are six stages, and he calls this the age of decadence. But this description is from a really brilliant soci sociologist, political commentator, William Ophuls, who I so respect his, his work and highly recommend it. It's O-P-H-U-L-S. I thought he was British, and I was shocked to learn that he's American. So that's just my impressions of my people here. So in the age of destruction, there. This follows a strong period of wealth and power. And then the empire starts to decline and they decline in identical ways. This is the work of Ophuls. Frivolity, aestheticism, hedonism, cynicism, pessimism, narcissism, consumerism, materialism, nihilism, fatalism, fanaticism, and other negative behaviors and attitudes suffuse the population. I really like that possibility. There's even more isms. A cabal of insiders accrues wealth and power at the expense of the citizens, fostering a fatal opposition of interest between haves and have-nots. The majority lives for bread and circuses, 
worship celebrities instead of divinities, throws off social and moral restraints, especially on sexuality, shirks duties, but insists on entitlements. Now, whenever I read that, I have to remind myself and all of you listening, this is a description that is generic, that it describes the end of every empire. It doesn't matter what the culture, what the faith base was, where it was located. This is how we always descend. And this is partly an, an, a lens into human nature. This is what Huxley was saying in Brave New World, that you could enslave people by offering them a sense, not just of security, but of happiness. So here we are in this world, and I don't have time to go into all these details, but we're in a world in which people have, have enacted this, or this is an accurate description. What people worship in every civilization at its end is sports stars, uh, actors, or in our case, movie celebrities, and musicians. And when I was writing this book in 2016, President Obama, who was then leaving, uh, awarded his presidential medals. It was written in the New York Times that he's giving the medals to sports stars, musicians, and movie actors, movie stars. And, you know, you just watch, uh, what royalty has become in, in Britain, it's just a celeb, it's a manifestation of the celebrity culture there as well. So other aspects of this time in all civilizations is that there's a belief on the part of leaders on their eternal greatness. The wealthy leaders believe they will always be leaders, so they relax their energies and they spend an increasing part of their time in leisure amusement and sport. This illusion of superiority causes them to employ cheap foreign labor or slaves to engage in menial tasks. And these poor people are only too happy to migrate to the wealthy cities of the empire. And there's a welfare state that finally, very beneficent funding universities, hospitals, even in ninth century, ninth century Byzantium, there were free hospitals for the people. But then the money dries up, the economy collapses, and it all goes, the doors get shut on the universities, the hospitals no longer serve, and that is where we are. I, I know this pattern very well. I've been sitting with it, studying it for several years now. And I have to say my own process at this point, I stay very well informed about what's going on all over the world. I think that's my responsibility, but I'm sitting there ticking boxes. You know, the elites take everything for themselves. Okay. Celebrity culture, tick. people craving only to be entertained, um, which was Huxley's vision of how you subdue people. He thought it would be a drug. Well, we do have terrible terrible addictions with drugs, but we also have Netflix, and we also have the internet, and we also have social media, which has completely destroyed any semblance of rational thinking. So, feeling that I have probably sufficiently brought you down, or maybe you find this relief, but we are in a historical moment. So then the question is, this is my book title, who do we choose to be? What is our work? now that we will not turn this around. We will not solve the climate crisis. I mean, the more recent reports have narrowed the window of opportunity down to just a few years. We will not create a just and equitable society. I was just reading a report that Melinda Gates put out asking for you know, radical transformation around women and girls and using this as an opportunity because we've all seen uh, what it's like for women and children at this time. But that's not where we are. We are now going to be scrambling, not we, but leaders are going to be scrambling to hold on to power 
the elites will continue to take everything for themselves. Um, the people may wake up a little bit. I'm certainly hoping that's true in the United States, but I personally don't fear Trump being reelected. I trump what will happen when he is not reelected because we have just below the surface this violence that is showing on the streets already in protests and counter protests. So who do we choose to be for this time? We still want to make a difference and we still need to make a difference. So also in Glove's uh, historical narrative, he speaks about at this time, there are always a few people and only a few people who realize that it is only through sacrifice and self-service that community can be maintained. And we are those people. I hope you are one of those people. These are the people that I train and affiliate and support now that I call warriors for the human spirit. You can read all about that on my website. It's just margaretwheatley.com. It's a very rich library and resource and support for you to be a warrior for the human spirit. And you can also find out about the new song line, which is quite something. So who do, who do we choose to be? Well, I think there are two things I wanna direct our attention to. The first is to get past any sense of arrogance that I'm, I'm doing, I'm working on purpose, I'm, I'm fulfilling a call. I mean, we all feel that, but right now, in order to keep our eyes open and in order to be of service, which I think if you go back to your own motivation, that is the fundamental motivation for all of us is to help other people, isn't it? To do good to create positive change. So now it, we had the luxury and the opportunity to define these great programs, these great uh, efforts that would create positive change. Now we face a, a future that is totally uncertain, but if you follow the pattern of history and the pattern of collapse, we know that further suffering, economic collapse, further environmental degradation and um, further hardship is what we're facing. The, my neighbor next door has just decided to load a ton of rocks. So I'm gonna put on my headphones so you don't have to hear it. So who do we choose to be? And how do we find the work that doesn't fulfill our purpose, but that needs us to be doing it? So here's a question that I put out to everyone now. To look around and ask, what is the work that needs doing? In this situation, in this neighborhood, in this family, in this organization, in this uh, association, what is the work that needs doing? Now, if you just stop there, you'd be overwhelmed with opportunities and you usually get very burnt out very quickly. So the second question is also very important. Am I the one who can contribute to that work at this time? What's going on in my life? What are my conditions? Do I have stability? Do I have support? Do I have time? Do I have resources? Do I have the skills? And do I have the physical health? And then from those multiple conditions or criteria, you can determine what is the work that needs doing and I'm gonna be the one to contribute to that now. It's very different than asking what is the work I want to be doing? It's what is the work that needs doing? Second is for us to realize that in the midst of so much desecration and destruction and human suffering, as well as planetary suffering, we need to embody the very finest qualities of human beings. We need to embody kindness, yes. We need to embody creativity, a sense of possibility. We need to embody sanity which is in such short supply these days. We need to embody compassion, 
generosity, patience, all these, these are eternal spiritual qualities I've just described. So how do we embody them? Well, that's where it comes to self work. We really need to be able to train our minds so that we're not beholden to all of our emotional ups and downs. We need to train our minds. And for me, there's no, I'm speaking about meditation now. There's no other path here. So that we know how we're seeing the world and we can work to clear our filters. So we can notice how we perceive. We can notice our biases. We can notice our triggers. And that we develop by being able to watch our minds as we are meditating. So this is not about inner peace. This is not about personal anything. This is about training ourselves, training ourselves to be the presence of insight and compassion. That's a definition a spiritual warrior right there. So these two things, being available to the world for what it needs, not what we need, but what it needs. And then doing the inner work. Many of us got excited about this recently, but it's inner work so that I can be a presence without my own stuff, without my own price tags, what, and without putting my conditions like, you need to love me or you need to respect me or you need to pay me. No, we're available as warriors for the human spirit to do the work that needs doing in a time of increased suffering and increased loss of, of understanding or the memory of what it means to be a good human being. How many people actually remember sane leadership or how many people actually remember just gentle convivial relationships certainly our teenagers don't anymore as they've grown up in this social media bullying world so what i'd like you to understand and and now we'll have time for questions is that we can be the embodiment the presence and the memory jogger of what it means to be a good human being and that is what is needed as the destruction continues. And that is what is needed because of where we are. So I want to just end with one, one last thing and then we'll open for questions. I often get people listen to me and say, well, you sound rather dark or well, you, you're very pessimistic. I'm an optimist. And of course, being an optimist is a badge of honor. And being a pessimist means no one wants to hang out with you anymore. So we always ask, so is the glass half empty or half full? So for me, the answer to that question as warriors for the human spirit is, look, there's water in the glass. Who needs it? And how are we going to get it to them? So that's working from the perspective of what does the world need? Okay, now I'm open to questions and i'd like you to just think for take a minute to reflect before you type in a question um, and then we'll go through them and select that's absolutely brilliant thank you so much Mike. that was um, a really inspirational talk can i maybe while people are typing something in can i just ask you you, you talked about how um hope is an ambush but yet not having any hope somehow makes this feel like a very hollow place for us to start from we always go there but hope is a false motivation because when your efforts fail then you go down in despair so it's always hope and fear are paired together because you can't separate them and what i'm speaking about is the gift of clarity when you know what needs to be done and you step forward and do it that's so much better than hope. That's present moment awareness. It's present moment communion with other people, which is the source of joy uh, when we're not there for ourselves, but we're there for others. Those, the, so much more rewarding day to day 
then hoping for an outcome that then will bitterly disappoint you. We have an addiction to hope in, in Western culture. We think we can't live without it. And what I'm finding and with hundreds of other people uh, is that um, when we do the work that needs doing, we are filled with joy. Mm. Much better deal than hope. Yeah, yeah. No, good, good. I'm, I'm going to have to try and find another way to find motivation without it um, depending on hope. But um, I will try and struggle with that one and maybe I'll make more sense of it as we, the talk continues. Can I ask, uh, Priscilla Boucher says, can you speak to the importance of finding islands of sanity? Yes, or creating them. This is a phrase that, um, and I just learned that Aldous Huxley wrote his, his uh, utopian novel, The Island, which I'm going to go read now at Dardington. So it's good to talk about islands of sanity. An island of sanity is, uh, you can look for one, but you can also start to create one. And by that, I mean, these are separated bordered, protected from the general craziness, the tsunamis that are hitting everyone now. And as a leadership challenge, there are places where you create the conditions for people to be, I define sane leadership as the creating the conditions for people to be generous, creative, and kind. There are places of refuge. There are places where we act well together, we behave well together, and we use the old, the processes so many of us have been trained in, if you're in leadership or community building of um, high engagement, you know, good conversations, real listening, and, and, but they have to be protected because the outside dynamics now are so violent and so destructive. So I'm, I'm sticking with this island image more and more as the seas around us rage so sometimes you can find it in a church group you can find it in a small community you can find it in a group of activists um, but you have to really notice is this a protected space where we're not at each other we're not engaged in competition and in blame which is the common pattern these days and are we truly working well together so that we can accomplish our goals, so we can accomplish the work that we want to be doing. So they're truly places of sanity in opposition to what's going on around us. Mm, no, thank you, Meg. Alicia asks, um, I've been thinking about doing a PhD in peace studies. Do you think this is helpful for humanity? Because it, of course, has a very political path. If not, what would you say makes a real difference? And where can you study that? Well, the first question, I'm, first of all, I'm not going to answer that. That's far too dangerous a question. I don't know you, and I don't know these different things that attract you. But I would ask you to go back to do you need to study anything? Um, there has been value in having PhDs. I certainly have found a great value in that, but I got mine 45 years ago. Um, why do you want to study? Because you think it will give you uh, more leverage, more status, so that they and you can do time. I, I don't encourage anyone to withdraw from it. Very helpful. Even Ten years ago, I'd all be doing this, now. and what is it? I think I want to contribute in any field of study at this point. Great, thank you. Sorry for a moment, I I lost myself there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> If uh, Fanny Martin sounds like she's coming from a similar position to me, I think, in terms of this, she's saying, if we're in a downward pattern of the cycle of civilization and doomed to fail in our effort for change, what or whom are we working for and how can we make space for the new? Well, isn't the answer right there in the last part of the question? 
And maybe the question is is not just read the last part again. To whom are yeah, what are or who are working, we working for? for? How can we make space for new? Okay. So I was asked this question once on an interview when the interviewer at a magazine said, well, if the world is going to hell, why do good? And I thought about it and I answered, well, if the world is going to hell, only do good. My God, why are we still so focused on oh, oh, these great achievements and these great successes and um, our, our grandiose plans for change that have failed? How much has that divorced us from what is truly the meaning of life, which is in every great spiritual tradition, and we all experience it. It is, it is um, the power of community, the power of loving relationships, and to be in a sense of total appreciation for the wonder of, of this life that we have. But I realize, because I've been doing this now for a few years, that's a big shift, right? But it's a shift we all have to make. How, what do we define as a successful life, as a successful work? And we have to, really, we have to give up these grandiose dreams and realize that in our present moment, awareness of nature in our present moment relationship with another human being that's what we are experiencing that is as i said truly joyful and it truly is the meaning of life i mean we're coming at this i mean you know we wouldn't be in these conversations if we were in war and our lives our very lives were threatened we wouldn't be looking for well how can i do what can i do here no we'd be in a much more personal survival mode. And even in those battlefields, people found deep meaning in saving, rescuing, comforting other people. I know this is a huge shift, but it is the shift that I see as the only path forward because it is a life of meaning and contribution, but not with our grand designs of the past. Mm. No, thank you, Mick. Joe Hicks asks, how do we influence our communities to reach a tipping point? How can we bring the island of sanity together? And I'm not sure so much in terms of reaching the tipping point or whether it's reaching realisation that we are at the tipping point. Um, yeah, well, I've been in this work and I would say don't try. <laughs> <laughs> embody it, embody it and be of service to others. And then when, and you'll find like-minded others, you'll find fellow uh, courageous ones out there. But this is not about convincing anybody because most people are locked down in fear and that fear and anxiety is only going to increase. Um, they're in, most people are in survival mode, especially in the West, Western countries where we thought life satisfactions were based on comfort and material well-being. Um, poor, economically deprived countries have never lost the truth that we can get through anything when we're together. So dealing with this in the West is an uphill battle, but it's, you're not going to, we don't become missionaries and we don't try and convince people. We just are who we are being the change, <laughs> mm. not because it's going to create greater change, but because it's that then magnetizes people who are curious, who are willing, who are interested. But it's always a small minority, always a small minority. I mean, the whole tipping point theory or approach, hold on. At one level, we were really deceived with optimism that if you had 10% of a, or whatever the percentage was, that all, everything good would follow through. Well, that didn't work out. But we have passed tipping points. We've passed tipping points with the climate. <laughs> We've passed tipping points, um, I think, with what's available in terms of community conversations, people's willingness to be together with difference. I think that we tipped past that um, uh, just a few years ago. So 
the tipping point concept, if it's anything, is the realization that there are many things that we can no longer change. And it was never this optimistic 10% or some percentage. These are massive shifts that happened. And then there's no turning back from them. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. Fiona McLean says, to do this work, um, do we have to be prepared to let go of seeing an outcome? And maybe I could ask that sort of alongside a question I had around, you have talked in other uh, places around uh, being faithful um, to, to your kind of your goals. And I suppose I'm interested in how you set a, a set of goals. Okay, it's not being be faithful, faithful to your goals. Okay. It's not about goals. It's being faithful to your, um, I use a quote by uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who said, faith is not a belief or disbelief in a God. It's understanding that love without rewards is valuable love without rewards, love without outcomes. So I don't have goals. I have real clarity on who I want to be in every situation and how I want to share that with other people. Um, because just for a moment, let's just talk about uncertainty here. If we haven't realized that the future is totally unknown at this point, well, then get serious about realizing that. There is no economic, there's no future that's come into form at this point. The only future that we do know about is the planet, mm -hmm. and that's devastating. But we don't know about how people are reacting. We see some very negative signs now of people going into survival mode or anti-government mode, or I'll just do what the hell I want to, or denial of science, or submitting to authoritarian control. We see a lot of these things. We don't know how they're going to coalesce, how they're going to vector together in a systems way, in an emergence way. We do not yet know the future, period. So you go ahead and try and set goals. You'll just be wasting your time. But working with yourself, developing a sense of confidence that I can be in these difficult situations, that I want to be in them, and developing, and this is from a basic faith that love without rewards is valuable. Mm, great, thank you. Hugh Pigeon asks, if the conclusion lies with personal dedication to personal qualities of compassion, generosity, and patience, and I think love, as we were just hearing as well, those teachings didn't need you to study how civilization collapses, so what did you learn from those studies? Are you with Jared Diamond that there are choices? Now, Jared Diamond's work at present moment is quite good, but his work on collapse lacked a lot of uh, depth and it had a lot of interpretations. Um, I've read a lot of the historians, starting with Toynbee, on, um, on the nature of civilizations and the rise and fall of civilization. This is so well established. I mean, the Greeks had it in their history, and we got we got sideswiped or uh, sabotaged almost by this uh, belief in progress, this belief that we were the, at the apex, that we were the most advanced civilization, the wisest, the most technologically um, gifted civilization, and that progress would just continue. It's still very deep, in, certainly in the American mind. Well, maybe not right now. And that's a 300-year-old myth. It doesn't play out historically. Um, the rise and fall of civilizations is only saying, pointing out that everything in life has a life cycle. Everything alive, we do. Birth, life, flowering, aging, death. Spring, summer, winter, fall. Why? So we have to see that this myth of progress, and that's, there are many books with that title, is, uh, is an aberration. It's a historical interpretation of what's possible. So, you know, just as when you're an aging person, you accept your limitations and you accept the reality that you only have a certain number of years left if you're lucky. Um, that's where we have to be with this 
as a society, as a civilization. And I have to say personally, understanding what's going on, I, I talked about ticking off the boxes, but at a much more profound level, this has given me a quality of um, peacefulness, not, not withdrawal, not cynicism, not uh, wondering what the hell is going on. The pattern is clear. And once I see the pattern, then I know what to do. I know my place in the history of this moment. And it's not about innovating. It's not about um, global, global change. Those were all needed, but it's not possible once you realize. It's like telling a 90-year-old woman that, well, now you should get ready and go compete for the Olympics. You once were a great swimmer. Why don't you get into training again? We have to realize where we are, and then who do we choose to be? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mick. Um, Sarah Deco asks, to speak out for sanity in an atmosphere of madness can risk provoking a hostile and sometimes dangerous response. Do you have any advice for enduring and surviving such a response? Um, I would move out of the way. <laughs> and, and but it's not going to be a comfortable position, is it? Some, the position you're, you're talking about taking is, is, um, is a position that many others will find very difficult to deal with. Yes, and so our, our generosity and compassion and understanding of their motivation is very critical. Um, but also what is critical is if it is, a, if you realize this is a situation in which I'm going to get hurt and there's no possibility, then you do leave it, you withdraw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. How do you, uh, this is from Bettina von Sam, how do you create community? Hello, Bettina. <laughs> <laughs> what is the essence of community, for example, with the group of warriors you have gathered? Well, you've been part of it, Bettina, so I think that's a trick question. <laughs> the essence of community is when people share common values, common cause, and also a common understanding of what's going on. Um, because then we don't fight, we don't blame, and we pay exquisite attention to our relationships. I've been saying this for years in any organization, but it's having a common view of what's happening by, and then we choose our work from that common view um, is, is one of the essentials here. I mean, we always did work on creating common values, common cause, right? but we didn't necessarily have a common understanding of what's possible and what's not, what's going on. And mm. that's been a significant learning for me. You have to have that. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, this maybe has to be our kind of last question almost. I think we we're almost at the hour, but um, Josie NG um, says, um, what is the work that needs doing around you? Um, I don't, can you find it? I don't understand that question. Well, I, sp I suppose the, the sense is that you, you were building a group of warriors um, to, to, um, for change. And I suppose the sense is, what is the, what is the change that's possible? What, is the, what are the warriors going to be working on? What is the... They're, you know, they are already... In a space. No, the warriors who come into my training are already leaders and activists and active citizens um, and they do range in age now greatly but we had a majority of people majority who were women first of all and then a majority of people who were older who still wanted to find their next contribution but they're already in the world they're not thinking about they're trying to either stay in their particular work mm -hmm. um, which in some cases, if you're working for the UN, it's a huge struggle. Um, if you're working in a battered school system, it's a huge struggle. But the first desire is to stay and learn the personal qualities of presence and awareness and compassion um, so we can stay. And then if we can't stay, we go and find 
other places to contribute. But we start as active in the world and we're just training for that to stay active. Great. Thank you so much, Meg. I'm sorry, we've only just scratched the surface of this and I wish we could go on and on and on. Um, and, so and I, I, again, I just want to refer everyone to my website because a lot of things are explained there and there's a great choice of podcasts and, and then you can also sample the song line, which is a, quite an experience. Yeah. Thank you so much, Meg. I hope we will have a chance to um, have you back and have more of a conversation about this, either face to face or again through through some some form of conversation like this. And, and as I say, you've um, we've only just scratched the surface and you've given given us a tremendous amount to think about. So thank you so much. It's so good to be back at Schumacher, even in this way. Oh, thank you. Um, can I thank all of you again as well um, for joining us tonight? and supporting the work of Schumacher College. We've got a um, further three talks in this series. And next week we have The Gods of Discard, Where Do We Go in Liquid Times with Beo um, Akamalofi in conversation with Andy Letcher, which I hope you'll want to attend. This talk's actually gonna be slight, slightly different to previous ones in that it takes place at 7.30 to take account the time difference, uh, Beo's in India. I hope that Margaret's talk has whetted your appetite, in which case I would point you towards Meg's excellent books as well as her website and her Warrior of this Human Spirit training, which you can find online. We also have a number of short courses in MA programs at Schumacher College which deal with some of the similar themes. So do please look at our website and subscribe to our mailing list and follow us on Twitter for information on courses and future events. This has been our ninth online Earth talk and we would love to have your feedback on how we can continue to improve and also we'd love to hear about the issues, topics or speakers you'd like to see in the future. So can I thank you all again for your very active participation. There's some great questions, great comments, and I'm sorry I've only scratched the surface as well in terms of, of trying to read some of those out to, to Meg. But thank you again, Margaret Wheatley, for your time and for your patience, um, certainly with me and, and with us. And thank you all and good night. <laughs>